started. Um, hello and happy Pride to everyone in the room. Uh, welcome to Queer and BIPOC. Uh, this event is the second event in our virtual Pride series, which we are co-hosting with Oasis Legal Services. Um, you can catch the third part uh, next week on June 30th. We will be talking about folks who are queer and undocumented, and you can find the registration link for that um, in the description box. Uh, my name is Carlos. For those of you who don't know me, I use he and they pronouns, and I am the chief content director at Change Lawyers. Uh, my organization, Change Lawyers, is a legal foundation, and we fund the next generation of BIPOC and queer lawyers, activists, and change makers. Um, this event that you're about to be a part of was actually inspired by Oasis Legal Services, our partner and co-host. Um, Oasis is one of the only providers of legal services for LGBTQ immigrants on the West Coast, which is kind of crazy if you think about it, uh, because we have so many undocumented folks on the West Coast. I myself am, am an immigrant, and I can tell you how scary it is to come to this country undocumented as a queer person. Um, so having a lawyer on your side, a good, honest lawyer on your side, makes all the difference in the world. So just big shout out, big round of applause, big hug to all the beautiful, amazing people at Oasis for literally changing people's lives. Um, and so I just want to express that gratitude to Oasis, and I want to express that gratitude to all of you who are joining us in the room today. Um, we're about to have a really powerful and beautiful conversation about the experiences of Black, Indigenous, and people of color queer folks. Um, and so just keep in mind that if you are not BIPOC, um, keep that in mind when you're engaging in the comments section about how much space you take up, because this conversation will center the voices and experiences of BIPOC queer folks. Um, and speaking of um, the conversation, I wanna introduce you all to our moderator, um, Ari. Uh, Ari is the moderator for all three virtual events um, and they will be moderating today's conversation as well. So welcome Ari. Um, Ari is the Residency and Naturalization Program Manager at Oasis Legal Services. They are a graduate of UC Berkeley School of Law. And fun fact, Ari and Change Lawyers go way back. Um, they were actually one of the very first uh, Change Lawyers Legal Fellows back when they were a law student. Um, and at Oasis, Ari represents a Sali client applying for lawful permanent residency and naturalization and advocates for culturally appropriate services for all LGBTQ plus asylum seekers and asylees. So once again, welcome Ari. Um, I also wanna um, invite Sharita Gruberg um, to join us. Welcome Sharita. Uh, Sharita is the vice president for uh, LGBTQ research and communications project at the Center for American Progress. She has a lot of experience working in the space around immigration advocacy law and policy and has experience providing direct services to immigrants, refugees, and folks seeking asylum. Uh, Sharita is a lawyer uh, and a graduate of Georgetown Law, where she was a writing program director for the Georgetown Journal on Poverty, Law, and Policy. So welcome and thank you so much for joining us. And lastly, I want to um, welcome and invite Arya Saeed. Um, we're very happy to have you, Aria. Thank you so much for being here. Aria is a transgender advocate and award-winning political strategist. She is the founder and executive director of Compton's Transgender Cultural District, the world's first ever transgender district, celebrating the resilience, culture, and presence of transgender folks in San Francisco. Aria also dabbles a lot in public policy efforts. They uh, are one of the co-creators of the first ever sex worker protection law, the prioritizing safety for sex workers, um, and also the Name and Dignity Act for incarcerated transgender people. Aria has been featured in Forbes, in CNN, Huffington Post, The Guardian, Vice, a lot of different places. And um, just last week, if you all didn't catch it, Aria um, was featured on Good Morning America, 
as part of their uh, series on Pride. So thank you, Aria, for being here. It's an honor to have all three of you as part of this conversation. Um, and Ari, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, Carlos. Yes, welcome everyone. Um, as Carlos said, my name is Ari, I use they, them pronouns, and I am a lawyer with Oasis. Um, welcome. Before we get started, um, as Carlos mentioned, I want to acknowledge I am white. I am very much a part of queer and trans communities, but I think it's very important that I decenter my voice and the voice of all white people, especially when we're discussing the intersectional experiences of black, indigenous, and people of color queer folks. So for this reason, Aria and Sharita will be doing most of the talking today. I'm here as a representative of Oasis and to facilitate. Um, and as Carlos mentioned, I like to set that intention that for the next hour, we'll be taking a step back listening and learning, and I ask all the white folks present to do the same. Um, so if we could start, Arya, if you want to introduce just your pronouns and maybe a little bit about your current work. Uh, well, good afternoon. Happy Pride, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Arya. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and yeah, I... Um, I'm so fortunate and so lucky to be able to lead the work of the Transgender District in San Francisco where um, we are literally a district. I think that's the number one question that we get asked. Um, so transgender is a place on earth, um, literally. <laughs> um, but we also do you know, national racial justice work with Movement for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter and, and we do policy and... Um, arts and culture and all it's it's literally like a gumbo is what i like to call it um of, of beautiful work that's led um by trans people for trans people um and i'm very fortunate and proud to you know share that our work um is is entirely led by trans people of color um and so you know very rarely do you get to see um, an LGBT organization or a trans -led organization at this scale that also then has uh, the le level of diversity and inclusion and, and um, intersectional experiences? I mean, uh, the leadership at our project is um, one of our folks is undocumented trans Latina, another person is a uh, Korean trans woman immigrant, um, and the list goes on, like everyone comes in and we're sort of like the United Nations, uh, but like trans. So it's it's really fascinating and, and it motivates me to wake up every morning um, with joy. So thank you for letting me be here. Thank you. Sharita, would you like to introduce yourself and just a little about your current work? Sure, hi everybody, Sharita Gruber, she, her pronouns. As was mentioned, I have the absolute privilege of leading the Center for American Progress's LGBTQ team. Uh, Center for American Progress is an independent nonpartisan research an advocacy organization. Uh, we have about 20 different policy teams that the organization works on, everything from immigration uh, to poverty. We have a disability justice initiative um, and we do a lot on health as well. Uh, also foreign policy and climate. Um, and the LGBTQ team really represents the organization in that uh, we work on just about every single issue uh, CAP works on through the lens of how these policies impact LGBTQ people. Uh, we really consider ourselves the footnote of the movement. And so we uh, provide the research and data and uh, policy analyses uh, to help support the work of amazing on the ground advocates. And really uh, our work is informed by the experiences and needs of our community. Um, and that's kind of our theory of change and how we uh, decide what we're working on and our approach. So really thrilled to be here today. Fantastic, thank you. And I want to acknowledge that unfortunately, uh, Professor Russell Robinson was unable to join us today. He had a change in his scheduling, um, but I do encourage everyone to, to check out uh, his research as well. He's a brilliant professor at UC Berkeley Law. Um, awesome, so this discussion will really talk about a lot of different things, but sort of starting out from maybe a more historical perspective, um, thinking about the intersection of how the AIDS pandemic specifically stigmatized um, LGBTQ plus black indigenous people of color folks um, and immigrants as well. Um, so Aria, um, in your experience and your understanding, what is the legacy of the AIDS epidemic for these communities specifically, the legacy in terms of stigma, 
um, laws, societal response, anything? Mm, um, you know, it's interesting to, um, what I love about Pride, um, I always have mixed emotions every Pride season, um, but what I do love is that it does force us to reflect on the progress that we've made. And I think these uh, this year and last year um, are two instances where we've seen how the the movement and fight for health equity for in, in regards to addressing AIDS and HIV and how that has actually informed the work of COVID, mm -hmm. um, addressing COVID, um, how the researchers have sort of been a, a lot more vocal about using the pre-existing research and labor of HIV activists and scientists, right, to then inform how to sort of create a vaccine. And yet there is this way that we see how quickly a vaccine for COVID was sort of created and administered in a way that has not been, um, right? Like the, uh, the fight for health equity and addressing um, AIDS and, and HIV has been going on since the late 70s when it was first discovered. And to see that because that was not considered an issue that affected sort of cisgender, white, straight, folk, it then was not prioritized in the same way, right? And so um, the context of, uh, of HIV, instead of understanding that it is something that impacts everyone in very different ways, um, and turn of a vaccine, I feel like there's this way that, you know, and this is just like in funding and like even messaging um, about the virus and about the health disparities. Um, and the research continues on and sort of, you know, announces that it, it adversely impacts, you know, black folks, brown folks, um, you know, poor folk, what have you. And because it's not um, seen as impacting everyone, it therefore, you know, there still isn't a cure. And I think, um, I think we still see the stigma today, even in the midst of so much progress. Um, I think now there's like, uh, there's methodologies at play that you can go to a doctor and you can take like pre-exposure prophylaxis and, and what have you to sort of prevent the transmission of HIV. And on the flip side, if someone is HIV positive, there's a way that um, with uh, adherence to medication, um, there's like viral suppression, but I think the, the there's still it's still heavily stigmatized i think the education has not evolved and has not reached the people that are most impacted um and i think socially like the work that has been done and what we know about hiv has actually informed something like COVID. and so to see uh, addressing COVID, excuse me so just seeing that inequity in particular where you know, COVID is one of the few viruses that we've seen that impacts every single person, regardless of who you are and what background you come from, right? And I mean, early on in the pandemic, it was like, oh, it's the great equalizer. Um, <laughs> that's a whole nother story, right? It's very different to be, you know, COVID positive in your mansion than it is to be, you know, poor and COVID positive with like no place to shelter or, or, you know, socially distance and all those things. That's a whole nother thing. But, you know, as it correlates to age HIV, it, it leaves me wondering um, what more the institutions and the decision makers around health and disparity uh, could be doing um, to, to address that huge gap. Um, because seeing the strides made in COVID and addressing COVID um, versus HIV and AIDS is, um, it's very stark. And then it's, and if you sort of look at it more critically, I think it is rooted um, in who's impacted, race, gender, class. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely makes sense. Following up on, on what you were sort of identifying in terms of um, a lack of uh, care and resources being put into uh, care and treatment, at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic and, and continuing that legacy, do you see other areas where um, 
BIPOC and LGBTQ communities with certain like needs are not being addressed because those needs aren't impacting larger communities or white, cis, heterosexual communities? Um, yeah, I think the, the root cause of many of the sort of social issues we see is the inequality um, that's experienced when it comes to things like jobs, housing, um, social acceptance, um, discrimination, uh, sort of, I mean, every, I like to share with folks that, you know, politicians always do this thing where they're like, oh, this is a trans issue, or this is a black issue. Uh, but the reality is, is every single issue that you can think of is a trans issue, right? Every single issue you can think of is a black issue, is a poor person's issue, is a sex worker issue. We are not single issued people. Um, and yet there's this way that, you know, in working in politics, um, because they're thinking of thousands of people. They're just sort of thinking of like the general consensus of a p entire race or entire group. Um, and I think the the contributing factors to what we see in terms of the amount of inequality that's there is is really rooted in um, access to safe, affordable housing, access to um, employment that. Um, is sort of protected and um, seen as as valuable as like knowledge based jobs. Um, yeah, I think the messaging and the culture is different. Like, I think yeah, I think those when we actually dig deeper, um, it always translates to who has the same level of access. And and as we know anecdotally, but also through statistics. The people most impacted are, you know, Black, Indigenous people of color, and and there becomes like a caste system in the United States where that becomes more prevalent. Thank you, and of course, Rita, if you want to jump in on any of these questions, feel free. Um, but I was going to bring in again more uh, historical context. Uh, so this is a very intentionally broad question. We could talk about this for days. Um, but what are some ways that the U.S. immigration system has been influenced by racism, homophobia, any anti-queer sort of sentiment? Sure. I mean, the whole idea of the nation state and citizenship is predicated on exclusion. And in the U.S., that has been exclusion based on uh, race in large part, um, you know, for even you know, from our founding uh, with our uh, original sin of slavery, you know, we we forcibly brought in um, black people and denied citizenship. Um, and so I think when we're also talking about immigration, it's really important to keep that context. You know, immigrants aren't a monolith in this country. Immigrants did not all arrive here in the same way um, and did not have the same experiences. And so, um, you know, we have folks who are excluded from, um, entry excluded from citizenship and then forcibly uh, brought here as well. And then also on top of that, uh, we, you know, are, are brought onto land that was already uh, inhabited and lived upon. And, um, you know, we, we've established this country and these rules on top of uh, indigenous folks that were also excluded. Um, so these are kind of some more contexts that I wanted to bring into the conversation, um, you know, being, uh, of Asian origin, it wasn't until um, a while that pe people who looked like me were able to be citizens in this country. Uh, Chinese Exclusion Act explicitly prohibited uh, Asian folks from coming in, and then the Immigration Act of 1924 prohibited uh, Asian folks, people of Asian origin, from being citizens. Um, and then for LGBTQ folks, uh, you know, we didn't have explicit bars to LGBTQ folks entering the country until 1964, but, um, or 1965, but uh, with before this explicit bar uh, for LGBTQ folks entering, uh, the way that our immigration laws were carried out excluded LGBTQ people. Um, so for example, uh, the prohibition on people entering who could become a public charge, that uh, designation got a lot of attention under the last administration, but it's something that um, has been part of our immigration uh, regime since 
well before, you know, in the late 1800s, they were using this public charge designation to prohibit people from entering. And there's this really phenomenal book by Margot Kennedy that talks about the application of that was used in a lot of times to apply to people who, uh, you know, today we would consider them to be part of the LGBTQ community, but back then that wasn't the same identity, but, you know, people who per, uh, were, were not gender conforming uh, in a lot of ways. And the assumption there for immigration um, folks was that they would not be able to get um, employment or would be, because of their gender nonconformity, were more likely to engage in illicit activities or illicit um, markets. And so those were used as excuses for not allowing entrance into the country. And so even before we had uh, in the Immigration and Naturalization Act with like this explicit barrier or bar, um, there were other ways that in practice uh, these communities were excluded. And it's really recently that LGBTQ people were permitted to enter the country, um, you know, not until 1990. And then the HIV ban wasn't lifted until 2010. And so um, we're talking about very, very recent developments to, you know, have a legal structure uh, that allowed entrance to the country. Um, but, you know, in terms of in reality and in practice, the accessibility of uh, visas or lawful routes to entering the country is, continues to be uh, something that is kept away from LGBTQ folks. Um, and then when you're talking about different communities, our, uh, the application of our immigration laws uh, continues to be very unequally applied um, based on race. And so, um, it, you know, it, it's the roots of this are very old, but not uh, not anywhere near gone from our current immigration um, law and policy and application. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So helpful. Um, so as she just said, it's not gone. <laughs> These things are playing out today. Um, Aria, how do you see the intersection of this anti-queer, anti-racist, uh, sorry, sorry, anti-queer and racist sentiment um, playing out in society today. Um, I want to use this as an opportunity as a sort of consciousness raising for our audience. Yeah, um, I think we're seeing, you know, the higher levels of transphobia and um, anti-queer sentiment, they have never gone away um, and in a very similar but not the same way as racism. I think there's a way that um, the Western world has learned how to sort of cloak um, their expression and their, and their views on on certain bodies, and so I think um, I think we're seeing that play out over and over and over again. I was just telling someone yesterday. I think the reality is is like trans and queer people of color are wounded and still having to fight. It's like we never get a, a, it feels like we get one small victory and then it's like an avalanche. And then there's like another small victory to celebrate. And so we've seen this play out, you know, in 2020, right? The, the height of sort of the world right now, if we think about it but outside of COVID, if we think about the timeline and the level of progress that we see, I live in San Francisco um, where, you know, this is considered the, the mecca for like innovation and tech and progress and um, from legislation all the way to sort of robots coming to deliver your food and roll down the street with your little lunch and stuff like like you know the progress that has been made um you know we're not listening to music on eight tracks anymore you know what i mean like there's a way that all this technology all this innovation all this progress is happening around us and yet the Supreme Court is deciding whether it's legal or illegal to discriminate employment based on someone's gender identity or gender expression or perceived sexuality. Um, and so it's such a, I don't know, it's such a catch 22 to live in two worlds at once. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, especially when you are also a person of color, um, 
it's even more compounded because you're getting fought from every side. It's like literally a group of people are standing around you with daggers and just going in and out. And some days that's really what it feels like. Um, seeing, you know, the previous president um, create such harmful rhetoric on one of the smallest populations in the United States, trans people. We are a very, very small population. And I think because there's so much more visibility, people forget to digest <clears throat> that we make up less than 1% of the world, or excuse me, the world probably, but like also in the United States, we are a very small population and yet there's been so much rhetoric and so much harm that's been facilitated against trans people. And then that has then continue on in the anti-trans legislation pieces that we're seeing across the country. Um, or even, you know, sort of Caitlyn Jenner and her run for governor and like, you know, showing that like there is a division of what it looks like to have sort of, again, we're not single issue people, right? And so um, what does it look like to be trans, but also rich and white <laughs> and sort of protected in that in a way that like, Black trans people, brown trans folk, um, you know, trans uh, trans folk who are trying to obtain asylum or what have you, and they're just doing good to be able to go down the street without, you know, smaller acts of violence. Those are those are the things that I think, yeah, we have to think about. And in the Western world, I think there's a way that. Um, you see time and time again that safety um only feels like a notion um and and it's sort of exclusive to white cis folk so even when we talk about um defunding the police um there's been such polarizing conversation but i think people are hearing what people of color and queer folks and trans folks are saying but they're not listening and so you know the most simplest way i can tell you is that we know inherently, and we've seen time and time again, that you know, police in our neighborhoods are not there to protect us, right? They are there to protect the state. They are there mm -hmm. to protect businesses and business owners, and more specifically, business owners who are sort of compliant as citizens, who are white, who are home land owning, home owning. I mean, you know, make no mistake, we live in the Western world, it is very much a feudal society. <laughs> that has, that aspect has never changed. It's just evolved in a very different way. And so, um, and so, yeah, I think that's just what I'm holding at the moment and, and seeing how progress is definitely not linear for our folks. There are ways that this year we've seen more black and brown uh, trans folks running for public office than we've ever seen before. Um, we've seen, you know, strides and um, the Brooklyn liberation just happened and, you know, the transgender district exists and there's all these amazing strides, but at the same time, it's like we only get to smile for a moment because then it's like the next battle and the next battle and the next battle. Um, like in 2021, you know, National Center for Lesbian Rights, I'm sure OASIS and Transgender Law Center um, and change lawyers are having to do all these different pieces of work to address all the different moments of legislation and sentiments and, you know, things like uh, Tyler, the young child in Atlanta who is being harassed by his family and like that's going by, like all these different things. It's just, it never feels like we get a moment to breathe mm -hmm. um, because we're always fighting a different battle. And, you know, if you add, the addition of being a woman or being black or brown or um and then you're fighting several other battles all at the same time yeah thank you i'm sure you had a really same question uh, in your work how are you seeing this the intersection of anti-queer and racist xenophobic sentiment play out in society today Sure. I mean, Aria just covered so much of what we're seeing. Um, you know, there's definitely tremendous progress on some levels. And then we see this very widespread harm and discrimination and differential treatment. Um, we field a national representative study 
and you know one in three LGBTQ folks reported experiencing discrimination in the year prior. Uh, for trans people, that was three in five. And when you look at Black LGBTQ folks, Hispanic LGBTQ folks, um, those numbers are so much higher. And then that has impacts on every single part of your experience. And so we see um, high numbers of people reporting physical harm, psychological harms from discrimination, um, really significant negative impacts on financial well-being and poverty. Um, and then, you know, folks turn their lives around to avoid discrimination because it's so traumatic and harmful. And so, you know, we are a few years post marriage equality and over half of LGBTQ people reported their ha they had a personal relationship to avoid discrimination. So people are still, you know, then oh, this was over half of LGBTQ people in the, we filled this in 2020. Yeah. And so it's still not safe um, for folks to be out in this country um, or to live publicly, you know, the, we're having some wins in the policy fight, but um, you know, as Aria said, for Black trans folks, for Hispanic trans folks, for LGBTQ folks in rural areas in the South, and you know, in over half of the country, uh, the reality is not that folks are able to live openly and free. Right. And then on top of that, the disparities from this pandemic have not impacted everybody the same. Um, my colleagues at the Williams Institute and the Human Rights Campaign um, put out some really disturbing research on just the ways that this pandemic and economic crisis have ravaged LGBTQ communities of color. And these are folks who were already um, disproportionately impacted um, by in, um, reporting lower rates of economic security um, and worse health outcomes. And, um, you know, what I'm seeing now is we still don't have a government that's even counting us. Um, mm. We had this pandemic and one of the things that I was pushing for throughout is, you know, count LGBTQ folks, ask about sexual orientation and gender identity. And with the federal government doesn't do that. Um, you know, basically California, <laughs> DC and Pennsylvania were the only, and New Hampshire, I think, were the only places collecting sexual orientation, gender identity data in COVID. And even then we're not reporting on it or using that data to analyze um, responses. Um, you know, we, we are starting from a point where the government doesn't see us and doesn't know, um, doesn't even have that basic uh, ability to assess uh, how policies are impacting folks. And on the immigration side, you know, we don't count that either. We, we have no idea how many LGBTQ refugees are resettled. We have no idea how our asylum system impacts LGBTQ people because the government doesn't count that. And that causes harm. Like, yes, there's concerns about data privacy and things like that, but that's all things that can be mitigated. But what they don't really grapple with is the harm that is done by not uh, asking these questions and not uh, having that basic awareness and you know, not even taking that first step to identify us in these systems. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. you know, we, I wanna... we still detain trans, we still detain immigrants. Like we're in a pandemic, we're seeing uh, the pandemic continuing to ravage immigration detention facilities. Folks who are detained still don't have access to the vaccine. Uh, and we're, we're back at detaining more folks every day. Um, so that still hasn't changed. Thank you. Thank you for hitting on so many different points. It's so helpful. I want to remind folks who are watching um, that we also do a Q&A portion at the end. Um, so if you want to post any of your questions in the chat, that would be really helpful so we can get to those later on. Um, great. I want to shift slightly um, and ask both of you um, if you see openings um, for improvements um, in our laws, regulations, community responses um, to this anti-queer, xenophobic, racist sort of uh, ideology effects, things like that. Um, yeah, so what are, what are the openings? What are you excited about or, or working towards in terms of that? Um, well, I think, I think there are some openings that we're seeing, right? And this is the catch-22 of progress. So, you know, during COVID, there was a way that we saw more response 
from government in addressing homelessness in particular, mm -hmm. and the ability to sort of leverage resources to then place folks in hotels and what have you, and sort of promote social distancing. And so to know that there was that capability um, that wasn't otherwise implemented, you know, when we've seen, you know, widespread disparity, poverty, and homelessness in more major cities across the country, um, especially in San Francisco, especially in LA, especially in Oakland, um, Portland, Seattle, like we're seeing the, the impact of these shifts in economies and um, housing prices going up and um, making these cities way more unaffordable, um, unfortunately. And so to see that response, lets us know that it is actually possible. It is very possible to cure many of the social issues that we're seeing um, and that there is a way that government can facilitate those things. Um, there's also, um, I think COVID also sort of taught us to be a little bit more creative. And so, you know, at the Trans District, um, for the last three years, we've been uh, piloting and replicating um, universal basic income strategies um, and so we were one of the first, you know, LGBT orgs to launch a COVID cash grant program um, right after London Breed had sheltered or asked, you know, San Francisco to shelter in place. And so we were able to provide direct cash transfer um, to over 600 trans people across the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and then we supported over 35 um, nonprofits across the country, mostly LGBT and trans led nonprofits to replicate that model, um, to support, you know, giving that. And mind you, we didn't, we didn't know if we were going to be closed down. Like, you know, the rules of 501c3s in this weird way can be really strict in some ways and really ambiguous in others. And so we were like, we're just going to do it. And like, if we get in trouble, we'll just get in trouble and we'll figure it out. Um, and so, you know, to see, that shift and sort of social change you know we as as a project we wanted to sort of challenge this idea that like poor folks don't know what um don't know how to address the needs that they have mm. you know we believe that if you give folks the resources quite simply folks can have the discussion to solve the issues that they're facing without all the hand holding and sort of the micromanaging and how are you using the money and we're only going to give you a gift card or we're only gonna, you know there's this way that um when you are poor and you need help in this country you are infantilized um and you're not trusted to sort of solve the issues that you're facing and so we wanted to prove that you know um in our case that trans folks who are poor especially thinking about how there are, you know, there are no safety nets when you do survival sex work. So, you know, everyone was raving and, and rightfully so in some ways about how unemployment in the United States was then going to expand to include like fringe economy, um, like income enhancement jobs, folks who are doing Uber and housekeeping or getting paid under the table or, you know, what have you like, and as long as they could sort of document that that's what they were doing, that they could get unemployment. Unfortunately, when you're doing sex work, there's no way that you don't pay into unemployment and you don't pay into. And so the only things that many of our folks had access to was the stimulus, right? But we were doing this before there was even talks of the stimulus. And so, you know, I'm very excited to report today that, um, you know, Mayor Breed is replicating um, our work to launch universal basic income in San Francisco for uh, trans folks. And I think, um, you know, we're also working with the city of Atlanta and uh, New York to to see about replicating UBIs in no cities as well. And so I think, you know, there is these people as as they understand, you know, our experiences more are being more receptive. Um, so there is some positivity in that, right? Like both and, mm -hmm. um, and I think, people are more open to addressing the real realities of poverty than they've ever been before. I think people are, um, and we're seeing that in different ways. We're seeing, you know, Mackenzie Scott, I think that's her name, um, from Amazon. I think that's her name. I think, I hope I got it right. I'm so mm -hmm. sorry, Mackenzie, you can donate to the trans district. I'm just saying. Um, but <laughs> she's been like, 
you know, sort of being a part of a culture that's already existed in resource generation and where wealthy, really wealthy people are learning how to give away their wealth mm -hmm. um, into the leadership of community and then community sort of leading the solutions to address the disparities that they face. Um, and so I think we're seeing more of that in the culture, or at least I'm hopeful of that. Um, and so those are some examples I think um, that are quite promising um, in addressing disparity. I believe that um, you know people who are making under 50K a year should have access to universal basic income, period. Um, I actually think it should be state sponsored. Um, and they can do that by taxing the corporations. Yay. Mm -hmm. Imagine that if we taxed all the corporations, none of us would actually be required to pay income tax. Or if we were, then the surplus of resources that they would have could go back into the hands of our most impacted folks. And then a lot of the issues that we see happening, you know, they would be addressed because people would have the ways and the means to take care of themselves um, in ways that are empowering and not tied to your ability to produce, um, right? And so even when we think about issues like, you know, immigration and, you know, Kamala, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris's recent statements and stuff, there is a way that, um, you know, immigration is sort of prioritized to folks that the institution of immigration believes would provide value to the economy of the United States. Um, and this is, I mean, I think particularly of any sort of Western country. Um, and so there are countries where they are regularly doing lotteries for people to then win the lottery to get citizenship in the United States to then go work because they are seen as like going to be able to fulfill like service-based jobs or, you know, what have you. And then there's you know, inequity when it comes to like who's desirable to immigrate. And and it's all, I mean, sometimes it feels like it's all tied to who is going to produce at such and such scale and and create the United, you know, keep making the United States this like global power. Right. Um, come through. I'm like, sorry, I normally don't talk this radically uh, in my session perfect. Uh, but y'all have inspired me so i hope i don't get in trouble but no those are just my thoughts <laughs> thank you thank you same question for you sharita what openings are you seeing what are you excited about what are you pushing for things like that yeah i mean so this administration has from day one set out a framework that can be built on to expand lgbtq rights and so I think there's a lot of opportunities there. I feel like I'm always cautiously optimistic with anything government related, but you know, day one issued the sweeping executive order to implement the Supreme Court's workplace discrimination as broadly as possible across government. And we've seen that happening. Um, so for example, we had uh, the Department of Education announce that they will be uh, implementing protections in education to include LGBTQ students. The Department of Justice has weighed in in opposition to uh, attempts in states to attack trans uh, student athletes. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services said that their protections against discrimination in healthcare and insurance are going to include LGBTQ people, which is um, really significant was one of the targets of the last administration. Um, even in credit and lending, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau announced that uh, their equal credit rules are going to include sexual orientation and gender identity protections. Um, so we're seeing a lot of really great movement. Um, data collection, you know, is near and dear to my heart and I'm still shouting at this administration to start counting us. Um, but the executive order on equity established a data inclusion task force that does, mm -hmm. um, that is recommending and pushing agencies towards collecting these data. Um, so I think there's definitely interest. Um, also with the equity task force, or the equity executive order until July 6th, each and every person can weigh in with our government on how to improve and expand equity across government. Um, so I highly recommend each and every person weigh in. Um, you can go to the Federal Register and comment that way. Uh, but they want to hear from us on, you know, how we can make grant making more equitable, how we can make government programs more equitable, how we can improve stakeholder engagement. And in, uh, the equity EO explicitly includes 
um, race, but also LGBTQ status, rural folks, people with disabilities. And so this is a great opportunity to tell the government um, exactly how to do this. Um, you know, we it still remains to be seen how this will be implemented. Uh, but, you know, the American Rescue Plan Act is, um, the provisions of that have the potential to really significantly impact poverty in our community. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as Aria said, a lot of money has come online to address homelessness and housing insecurity. And so I think what remains to be seen is, is it actually going to reach our folks? Uh, is it actually going to reach um, Black and Brown LGBTQ folks in our communities that are in need of this assistance? And so that's, that's where I'm at cautiously optimistic, um, but a lot of that framework has been established and now, uh, you know, that's better than we were a year ago. <laughs> I feel that very much in the immigration world. Um, there was a question from the audience about, I think you mentioned a book, Sharita, um, when we were talking about the uh, history, but folks also just wanted to know if there's any other recommended reading or curriculum um, about this in, these intersecting issues. So I love Margot Canaday's The Straight State more than anything. It goes through uh, public benefits, immigration, and the military, and how uh, our government has set up these structures to reinforce heteronormativity and uh, exclude LGBTQ folks and the foundation of our modern uh, government. So highly recommend it. Thank you. Awesome. I mean, for anyone too, Aria, if you have any reading, recommended reading <laughs> for folks or other sources for folks. Um, well, I um, I mostly have to read like RFPs and such most days. So I don't get to read for pleasure nearly as much as I used to, but um, I am actually currently reading The Purpose of Power by Alicia Garza. Um, and I am learning so much. I'm only on chapter four. I know I promoted this. I, I like promoted this book on social media like a few months ago, but then I like only got to read pieces of it and then like hear sound bites. Um, and so now I'm actually spending my Saturdays trying to read through um, and just like really digest and take notes. Um, I think if you don't have, I mean, hopefully you buy the book, but if not, um, I think uh, something that she's doing that's uh, really inspiring is like. Um, finding ways to support uh, building a sort of black political power in the United States at every single level and working to invest um, in uh, black and brown politicians and sort of support them um, with, you know, pr particularly progressive black folk um, and then helping them become decision makers in government so that we do see a lot of uh, the shifts that need to happen. Um, also, um, this isn't reading material, but um, some work that I'm very proud of that we've been able to do in San Francisco is uh, the Mega Black Coalition in San Francisco. We've been able to successfully work with Mayor Breed um, and Board President Shimon Walton to um, move 120 million from the police budget to then be regranted out to um, black, uh, specifically black led efforts. Um, so like alternatives to policing, healthcare, mental health services, like that are like grassroots. Um, the Trans District, we co-founded sort of the Black Trans Initiative Fund that is supporting and sustaining Black trans-led organizations like TGI Justice Project, which is a prison abolition project. They're working to sort of close the jail in 850 Bryant. Um, and then Taj's Coalition, uh, which has been doing really great work around supporting trans folks and getting a like, name and gender marker changes in the court system. And, and so like sort of sustaining those efforts while also, you know, protecting and, and providing uh, safety net resources for black small businesses. Um, and this is partly in response to a history in San Francisco where the black population used to be 22% in 1980. And now as of this year, it's 2.5%. Um, and there's been, uh, the out-migration of Black people in San Francisco is actually a document. Um, if you just type in on Google out-migration of Black people in San Francisco, you'll find uh, that the city of San Francisco, and James Baldwin talked about this often, played a huge role in seizing Black-owned homes and businesses and closing them down um, because San Francisco once had a sort of thriving Black Wall Street, very similar to Tulsa 
Oklahoma, except instead of being set on fire, uh, the power players of the city of San Francisco at that time worked around to then sort of dissolve black um, economic empowerment, right? Um, and so all of this, of course, again, the root cause of all of this is white supremacy. Um, and that is what just, once we fully dismantle that, we won't need to say things like Black Lives Matter or stop Asian hate or, do you, think, or you know what I mean? Like support trans folks because all of, the, all of these inequities that we're facing is really rooted in a culture of white supremacy. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And it has to be eradicated. Yeah. So I was wondering um, if the two of you can maybe, so we have, so we have a lot of um, lawyers in the room and we also have a lot of um, activists in the room, some of whom are maybe on their way to law school, um, some of whom are um, maybe just out of law school. So I'm wondering if you can address the folks in the room who um, might not necessarily be LGBTQ and might not necessarily be BIPOC, um, but they wanna show up for this community and they wanna do it not just during Pride Month. Um, I'm wondering if you can leave us with, hi, Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if uh, you can leave um, people in the room with maybe one actionable step thing that they can do to show up, even if it doesn't seem to be huge. Um, I think for me, um, so fun fact about me, I don't have a college degree. Um, and I love sharing that out because I've been able to work on several different pieces of legislation at the state level, at the local level. Um, of course, I lead an organization and, and what have you, but I am someone who dropped out after my first year of college um, and I did survival sex work. And so I think it's important to consider that um, when we're talking about jobs and employment, um, that there is a culture that's like, if you're not an academic, you're not like allowed in the space. Um, but how do you bring folks into the space to inform your overall work? And this is something that folks can do as they start to go out in their careers and um, you know work for judges or open their law firm or do legal advocacy in the social justice context or um, decide to do corporate law or whatever it is that they decide to do. How are you bringing in voices that are not represented in those spaces? I think every person, it, it, I'm sure for our allies, it is overwhelming to think about ways that they themselves can play, you know, a big important piece in the liberation of, of queer and trans folks in this country. But I think um, something that one can always do is look at their own personal environment and find ways to bring folks in. And whether that's, you know, you're working at a law firm and you're seeing that like the more entry level sort of low barrier positions are opening and the same people are sort of being cast into those roles, like working with HR and like the leadership and using your voice and your moment, you know, to then be like, how are we bringing in folks who are black and brown and indigenous and could benefit from this and also be a voice that we need to, to see and hear and, and be in community with in this space? Um, how can, you know, other ways is of course, um, well, it's summertime and the world is opening back up, but you know, come Thanksgiving, are you talking about these issues with your family, um, with your racist uncle? right or your grandma who's like always tugging her purse when a black person walks by like there are ways that you yourself can you know sort of be a voice and help sow seeds of thought you may not have someone sort of facilitate a paradigm shift right then and there but you're at least you know planting the seeds of consideration around the issues that entire populations are consistently facing day to day and um i think another piece too is to remember that Allyship is always a verb. Um, it is not a noun. Um, I actually hate when people are like, I'm an ally. I'm like, girl, no. <laughs> I need allyship to actually be an action, right? Because when it's an action, when it's a tangible thing, that's when I know that you actually are invested in our liberation. Um, and so, you know, of course, you can self identify as an ally to externally, but I think, you know, um, 
always thinking that it's an action, that allyship is an ongoing action, um, will definitely change what that looks like for, for folks who may not be black or indigenous or person of color, who may not be queer or trans, um, but want to give back and want to make sure that they're using you know, the privileges that they hold and their voice to uh, towards the safety and empowerment of marginalized communities. And Sharita, do you want to leave us with um, an actionable step? Yeah, I would just uh, recommend supporting the N Trans Detention campaign. If you go to ntransdetention.org, there's a lot of just amazing trans POC led organizing right now to uh, not just get folks out of detention, but stop the future detention of uh, trans folks. You know, we tragically lost two trans women of color completely unnecessarily uh, in detention. And there's just such tremendous uh, advocacy happening right now to um, shut it down for good. So uh, please sign the petition and uh, check out the site for ways to get involved with that campaign. Well, thank you so much. And we are at time. So I want to thank um, the both of you for joining us and really like building this little power hour with us, with, with Ari and I. Um, I know that Change Lawyers is so grateful to just be in community with you and the organizations you represent and the ideas that you represent uh, more than anything, um, the people you represent. Um, and I also want to invite folks to join us for our third and final part, which is going to focus on undocumented queer folks. Um, that's going to be happening uh, next Wednesday, June 3rd, 30th, uh, the final day of Pride um, to close out our series. Um, and you can find that information um, in the description box down below. Um, you will also all receive um, a recording of this conversation so that you can you know, share it out, keep it with you as a source of um, knowledge. Um, and I also dropped uh, the books that um, Aria and Sharita recommended in the chat box um, in the comment section so you can take a look at those. Um, so thank you so much. Aria, do you want to leave us with any, any parting with them? No, I guess just thank you everyone for attending and it's the final day of June, but pride goes on. Um, give your money to uh, BIPOC trans people. <laughs> That's my final word. Thanks so much everyone. Take care.